Why, hello there, and welcome back to another exciting episode of Brand Recognition is Apparently Much More Important Than Quality. So, uh, yes, the third 1D&D, &D, a.k.a. Dungeon & Dragon playtest packet has been released, and uh, obviously that's what I'm going to be talking about here because that's what I've been doing with all of the playtest packets. And this one does cover the cleric and revisits the player races. And... I will be going over the Cleric in a separate video, just because that's how I covered the playtest classes from the previous playtest packet, and I liked the one class per video format, so I am going to continue that, but, you know, there are other things in this playtest, and that is what I'm going to cover in this video. And the exciting thing about this playtest is we are starting to get revisions of content that was in the previous playtest packets. So we get to see if they are actually listening to feedback. So let's get into this, starting with the player species. That's right, they finally changed the term. All it took was like a decade of constant requests, their main competitor doing it years ago, and a racist space monkey scandal. So, um, you know, bullying Wizards of the Coast works, but, you know, you gotta really bully them. Anyway, this packet uh, focuses on three of the, uh, of the player species. The Ardling, the Dragonborn, and the Goliath. Which, honestly, uh, seems like they somehow intentionally chose my three least favorites. And now I guess I need to talk about the garbage ones. So, Ardlings have actually undergone a moderate redesign from their initial appearance in the first playtest packet. They've lost their Celestial Legacy ability, which determined what kind of Celestial they were, and then gave them a number of spell-like abilities, and for some reason determined what kind of animal head they had, uh, as well as their resistance to radiant damage, and their Angelic Flight ability, which allowed them to sprout wings and fly their move speed, but then you had to end that movement on a solid, you know, surface, or you would fall. And you know what, I'm just gonna say it. In general, player races with a fly speed are bad. It is either totally overpowered, or they have to limit it to prevent it from being totally overpowered in such a way that it's much more just like jumping than flying. And if you were familiar with the Ardling as it appeared in the Character Origins playtest, you may notice that that was all of the Ardling's abilities. Yeah, they basically just wiped the slate clean and started over from scratch. Unfortunately, they uh, are still refusing to wipe the slate clean and start over from scratch thematically, but that's a, that's a, that's a thing I'll get into later. So now, Ardlings have an animal ancestry, which specifies what kind of celestial animal they are descended from and therefore look like, and then each of the ancestry groups gives you some kind of ability like a climb speed or a swim speed or uh, wings, which allow you to glide to avoid falling damage or, you know, flap them to get a bonus on jump checks, and I hate to say this because, God, do I still hate Ardlings, uh, but... That's actually a pretty good and well-balanced application of wings for a player character. Also worth noting, uh, the examples provided do specify that your Ardling can be a dinosaur. I, I still don't like them, but at least they can be dinosaurs. Ardlings also get keen senses, which gives them proficiency in perception, and unfortunately, divine magic, which gives them a cantrip from the divine spell list. So basically, the redesign of the Celestial Beast Folk shifted almost the entirety of the design off of the Celestial and onto the Beast part. Which I guess does show that they were at least somewhat listening to the feedback, because that is the only aspect of the Ardling that anyone was interested in. No one wants stupid, angelic animal people, they just want animal people. And considering that one of the big goals they seem to have going in 1 D&D is the complete elimination of any kind of coherent lore or mythology, there's really no reason to come up with some stupid convoluted explanation 
for how one player species can cover a bunch of different types of animal people. And then also, there is the issue that Dungeons & Dragons already has a lot of different animal people races that people actually like. So, what is the purpose of the Ardling? If the goal is to replace all of the different types of animal people, you know, the Arakoka, the Kenku, uh, Sorials, uh, Ratfolk, etc., then they can do that with just, like, a beast folk species. People will be totally cool with that. They're not going to say, oh, well, that doesn't make sense, that, that it's not angelic in some asinine way. But if the goal is then to exist alongside all of the different animal people that are already there, then they really need to put some effort into explaining why we should care about having the celestial cat people in addition to just the regular cat people. And honestly, the whole thing just kind of feels like somebody's stupid little pet idea that they refuse to let anyone get rid of. Like, I must assume that the only reason that the Ardlings even made it into the playtest was because they were someone's idea and that person just made themselves everyone else's problem until they got their way. But now, let's move on to uh, Dragonborn, who I also do not care for, uh, but, you know, do not have the same level of hate for that I do for the Ardlings. The Dragonborn's breath weapon is now a 15-foot cone or a 30-foot line, and deals 1d10 damage with a save for half. And then the damage increases by 1d10 at levels 5, 11, and 17. For comparison, in the Character Origins version, the Dragonborn's Breath Weapon was only a 15-foot cone and did 1d10 plus level damage. So, there's a little more flexibility now in how you can use your Breath Weapon, but it also does a little bit less damage. Except at 5th level, where it does a tiny bit more. Then, as has been part of the overall design trend, they have lost getting Draconic as a bonus language, and they have gotten one new ability, which is Draconic Flight, which allows them, starting at 5th level, to once per day, for 10 minutes, sprout energy wings and gain a fly speed. And in addition to being thematically stupid, it is one of those things that is so specifically overpowered that most dungeon masters will just end up having to account for it when designing encounters, which kind of negates its usefulness. So, overall, one stupid ability added, they should probably stop browsing DeviantArt to get inspiration. Uh, one ability tweaked a little bit, but overall just... Another mostly unimpressive redesign of the Dragonborn. And finally, Goliaths. The, oh yeah, those are a thing of Dungeons & Dragons player species. Also, the only one here that did not appear in any of the previous playtest materials. As has been the closest thing to any kind of overall design philosophy so far... Goliaths are no longer a specific people with their own lore and culture and history, but just a generic classification for any kind of giant kin. As such, they of course have a new Giant Ancestry ability, which allows you to select which kind of giant they are descended from, each of which gives you some kind of ability. And that does include Stone's Endurance, which was the, uh, the default ability uh, for the 5th edition Goliath. And those are all usable a number of times per day, equal to your proficiency bonus. And, uh, I don't know, this is another one of those things where I like the idea of them being usable once per short rest better than a number of times per day equal to your proficiency bonus. On one hand, you get to use them more times a day at early levels, but then also, every encounter you know... I can use this ability, I'm not going to need to save it for later. Also, having an ability that you can only use once per encounter means it's also much less exploitable. They have also lost their bonus language, in their case Giant, as well as their proficiency in Athletics and Cold Resistance. They have gotten one new ability, which is Large Form, which, uh, this might sound a little familiar, starting at 5th level, once per day allows them to become a large creature, 
for a 10 minute period. And their powerful build ability, um, you know, still has them counted as a large character for the purpose of determining carrying capacity and such, but now also gives them advantage on uh, checks to escape a grapple. Although one more interesting note, they have a speed of 35 feet, which makes them the only player species so far in one Dungeon and Dragon that has a base speed that is not 30. So overall, it is another case of them trying to expand the mechanical options at the cost of any consistent lore. There is literally nothing to them now other than they have giant ancestry. And you know, I'll be honest here, making Goliaths less interesting from a world building perspective is kind of impressive. It's like making oatmeal even more bland. So overall, there is this kind of weird feeling here that they keep making templates, but then just kind of applying them arbitrarily. Like Dragonborn and Goliath now both for some reason get an ability at level 5 that allows them to power up for one 10 minute period a day, and then the Ardlings and the Goliaths both get some kind of ancestry that allows them to pick from a category and get some sort of associated ability. And then if we go back to the original character origins, there was the Ardlings and the Tieflings and the Elves had these really similar abilities, and it just seems like they are trying to make things consistent and standardized, but, like, have no idea how to do that. Or, you know, as I've suggested before, it's just a bunch of people working independently with no communication and, like, no established goals between them. Anyway, um, that is it for the player species, and there is other stuff in this packet which I will now go over, and a uh, very nice addition, there is a change log which tells you the things that have been changed. I would prefer, like, an errata that, you know, just listed out the specific changes, but, uh, you know, take what we can get. So, uh, I guess I will just go through the whole list, uh, I will be comparing to either the previous playtest versions of these things, or, if they were not in the previous playtests, uh, the player's handbook. The aid spell now targets six creatures instead of three, and gives five temporary hit points instead of increasing maximum and current hit points by five. And this change also means that it is instantaneous now, instead of a duration of eight hours. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, both versions are fine, it is essentially the difference between a better bonus right now versus a smaller bonus that lasts all day. The attack action now states that you can equip or unequip one weapon before or after each attack instead of any attack, and I assume that is just a language thing, possibly to make it a little more clear that it can be done multiple times if you have multiple attacks. The Banishment spell has had its range reduced to 30 feet, and now allows for a save at the end of each of the target's turns, so there's a moderate nerf on that one. It was a pretty powerful spell to begin with, but mm, overall not a fan of the redesign. The Grapple Condition no longer states that you must move outside the Grappler's range without using your speed to break the Grapple. and. That might be the removal of some redundant language, or it might be them changing things in reference to something that I am unaware of. The Guidance spell has had its range reduced from 30 feet to 10 feet, but also lost the restriction that you can only be affected by it once per long rest. And other than that, it is basically the same, a reaction that allows you to add a d4 to a character's failed ability check. And I do like this version better, I like the idea of being able to use it more, I like being able to use the abilities. Uh, perhaps uh, they should add something about only being able to use it once on a specific task, so if you fail your roll and then get Guidance and still fail, you can't get a second Guidance to try again. The Influence action has been moderately simplified. Basically, now if a target is friendly, you get advantage on the roll. If a target is hostile, you get disadvantage on the roll. And the DC is just the higher of 15 or the target's intelligence. Which replaces the need for, you know, 
a DC 10 and DC 20 result for each attitude that a target might have and just, you know, overall makes things a little bit simpler. So I do like this version more. I'm a strong believer that if you can remove a table, you remove that table. Also that like any rule that you have to look up every time you use it is a bad rule. The light weapon property now specifies that you must be holding a second weapon in your hand when you make the first attack to get a second attack. And once again, this is possibly just a language thing to be a bit more clear, especially taking in consideration the changes in language that were made to the attack action regarding equipping and unequipping weapons. And basically those two things taken together means that as an attack action, you can draw a dagger and make an attack, but you cannot then draw a second dagger and make a second attack because you needed to have been holding the second dagger when you made the first attack. A long rest now specifies that you can resume after being interrupted if you can do so immediately, and also that you must wait 16 hours before taking another long rest, as opposed to one long rest per 24 hour period. And it's just a bit more clear on the language there that you do have to wait a period to take a long rest instead of like, oh, we took a rest at eight o'clock last night and uh, now we're going to take another one at noon because it is, it is a different 24 hour period. The magic action has a very small change made in the language, basically just stating that magic items require a magic action to activate instead of an action. And of course I have to mention that because I was like, oh, I'm going to go through the whole thing and now I have to go through all of them even if they are uninteresting. The Prayer of Healing spell now targets a number of creatures equal to your spellcasting ability modifier instead of six and now provides the benefits of a short rest plus an additional 2d8 healing instead of 2d8 plus spell casting ability modifier healing. Uh, also, now you can only be affected by it once per inter long rest period. So overall, in general, a worse version of the spell, unless for some reason you really need to take a short rest in 10 minutes but only like once per day. The contents and price of the priest pack have been changed a little bit. I'm not going to go over all of those things. Resistance now functions basically like guidance, except that instead of triggering on a failed ability check, it triggers on a failed save and then you can add a D4 to that save. So uh, yeah, it, it functions like guidance. I like this new version of guidance. So I like this new version of resistance. Spiritual Weapon has had its duration changed to concentration up to one minute instead of just one minute, uh, and now gets an additional D8 for every level of spell slot you cast it at above uh, two, instead of one extra D8 for every two levels of spell slot you cast it in. Uh, overall, kind of a worse version, I'd say. Like... Unless this is a spell that you use at higher levels regularly, it doesn't really seem like an even exchange the extra damage for having to concentrate on it. And finally, True Sight. Uh, I don't think it's actually changed at all. It's just uh, written much better. And that was the uh, the Dungeon and Dragon uh, playtest packet 3, um, well, like half of it. Uh, well, you know, more than half, actually. Uh, and honestly, it's better than the previous two playtest packets, but also it feels like this is the level of quality we should have gotten in the first playtest packet. Like, it feels like there was actual time and effort put into, you know, putting everything together instead of the kind of rush job feeling that I got from the previous two. Unfortunately, I just don't have that much commentary because the Ardling, the Dragonborn, and Goliath are just three things I don't really care about. Like, they made the Ardlings better mechanically, but they're still absolute garbage thematically that nobody wants. And for some reason, they just, like, refuse to even consider that that might be the case. And the Dragonborn, well, they've kind of always been, like, the less edgy option 
for a try-hard character. Like, if you are very, very concerned that your character be very, very cool, but also you feel like a tiefling is a bit too extreme, like, you don't want to go that way, uh, you make a Dragonborn. And the new stupid Draconic Flight ability just makes them feel even try-harder. Like, they're just insisting to you how cool this Dragonborn is. Ooh, they have fire wings because they're a red Dragonborn. And Goliaths? Who cares? They're Goliaths. And then, as for all the other rule changes, I kind of like some of them. I kind of don't like some of them. Overall, just, I don't have a strong opinion on any of this stuff. Except for, like, the Guidance and Resistance, which I did quite like. So, I guess that is it for this video. I will be back soon with the Cleric. I will be doing a full run-through of the class. Uh, but until then, thank you for watching. With X special thanks to my Fight and Flail Snails, Samuel Gorski, Random Holland, and Toshiro Crow. If you'd like to be cool like them, you can check out my Patreon, where you can get early access to videos and fun stuff that I make for the Patreon. But if you don't want to do that, that's cool too. You can still hit all of the lovely buttons, like, subscribe, these other videos that either myself or the Cold Heartless YouTube algorithm have lovingly selected for you, which I'm sure are lovely videos that you will also enjoy. And I will see you next time.